So my name is Melanie Schnalbegun. I'm the Managing Director and Head of Philanthropy at Morgan Stanley. It is with great excitement that I have the opportunity to kick off 2017 Tycon Social Impact. And over the next two and a half hours, we're going to learn from some of the country's great thought leaders who through their personal actions, their corporate actions, and then also through the creation of new social enterprises and models are setting the world on, on fire and teaching us all how to imagine, how to innovate, how to inflect in order to see the, the changes that we want to see in our world. And as my new friend Ira and our morning speaker, who's going to dazzle you, once said in a video that he did um, at his daughter's school, change is at our feet. It is our responsibility to run towards it. And today, we're not going to walk, we're going to run. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Ira Price, the founder and managing partner of Double Bottom Line, also known as w, w, uh, DBL Partners, a leading impact investment venture capital firm focusing on investing in companies that not only provide venture capital, but also work to enable social, environmental, and economic improvements in their sectors of business. Ira is changing the notion that going green is either for the sake of the environment or for the sake of the financial return. He believes the or is changing and now we can have an and. Ira is a recognized leader in the venture capital industry, having served on the board, executive committee, and as an annual meeting chairman of the National Venture Capital Association. Ira serves as the president of the Western Association of Venture Capitalists and as the co-chairman of the VC Network, the largest and most active California venture capital organization. If that isn't enough, in 2007, Ira was named as one of the top 50 most influential men under 45. So I guess that makes you almost 55 now. I would now. rather win that award today. <laughs> I, think, I think he's too old to win that award today. And in 2014, was inducted into the International Green Industry Hall of Fame. Ira serves on many nonprofit and corporate boards, including the Board of Visitors of Stanford Law School, the Advisory Council of the Stanford Precourt Institute for Energy, the Stanford Global Climate and Energy Project, and the corporate boards of Tesla Motors, Appeal, and Mapbox. During his free time, Ira founded and chaired one of the most prominent annual energy innovation industry events, the World Energy Innovation Forum, which brings together the who's who in the industry to discuss the important energy issues and opportunities of our time. And because we already realize that he's not really smart, um, he also just, you know, he has a JD, an MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business and Stanford Law School. So it's with great excitement that I join you in welcoming Ira. Thank you. Can I just say it is, it really is fantastic to be here with you, Melanie. This is, what a great event. I am just so impressed with Tycon each and every year. Uh, you know, the amount of energy that Vish uh, and Murali, Anu, Nihar, and Shakar put into this track. Uh, just so appreciative of the time and effort you spend. And you really do have a great set of speakers for this track. Uh, so many friends that, uh, that I've seen here today already have Darren Dodson and Julie uh, on the next track. It's going to be terrific. And uh, I'm privileged in that one of the reasons that, uh, that I do what I do is for the next generation. And I'm, I'm just honored that actually my daughter is here today uh, as well. So. Anyway. It's going to be great to engage. Melanie is an absolute rock star, and the way she was introduced uh, only begins to capture the incredible work that you're doing and at Morgan Stanley, uh, focused on this initiative, and uh, I'm just honored to be here with you today. So thanks, Melanie. All right. Well, now that we're done with our Mutual Appreciation Society, <laughs> um, we're going to get down to business. And I noticed, you know, originally this was supposed to be a fireside chat. That's supposed to be in comfortable armchairs. <laughs> We're supposed to be sitting alongside of each other. And there's supposed to be a fire. Um, but 
There we go. I like that. So but marshmallows, a little marshmallows, a little s'mores, a little s'mores. Um, but we're going to set this place on fire. So, Ira, you can't pick up a magazine, you can't pick up a newspaper without reading a story about impact investing. And the irony is, you know, I run philanthropy at Morgan Stanley, so we talk about impact all the time too. Mm. But it's a different kind of impact. The impact that I do with my clients is when they're giving their money away. Sure. So here, what I'd like you to do is, you know, how do you define impact? How does your firm define impact investing? Yeah, it's a great question, and you're absolutely right. Impact has really gone from, in, sense, in some sense, a marginal term. In fact, the term impact investing didn't really even exist until 2007, uh, but it has begun its emergence toward mainstream. Uh, when we got started at DBL, and I want to really give credit to my partners who just do incredible work in this arena, uh, there were a few people who believed you could get non-concessionary uh, financial returns. And there's always been this notion of doing well and doing good, but this notion of investing together, trying to find in many, uh, what we aspire to do, which is to get better than market rate returns, uh, in, as far as our practice, was really not uh, something that was uh, um, widely shared. The conventional wisdom, I think you said it well in the, uh, in the opening, is that it was an either or. You could either do something to change the world for the good, or you could focus on financial returns. And it really has been a notion historically of divorcing the make money by day, give it away, think about how we're going to impact the world at night. And impact investing is really a way of developing this integrated approach to how we, how we want to both uh, make our money, think about the way we're uh, spending our professional lives, but integrating it with what mission-oriented, purpose-driven approach we have uh, as part of our overall ethos. That's a great, that's a great definition, and, and it allows us to really see it, that integration. And I will say that, you know, mostly this was thought of as negative screens in the early days. This was thought of as, uh, as what not to invest in. And in many ways, it was thought of as the divest side, uh, as the way you were going to have impact. And what's emerged is this notion, this is not about what not to do, not about identifying the problems, but this is about, develop, about investing in the solutions. Mm -hmm. And it's the corollary of what's emerged as the divest-invest movement, as opposed to historically it really been focusing on the divest side, just the problem, just what not to do. And the venture capital approach that we have is about really investing in and finding the entrepreneurs who have the solutions to the very problems that were well identified in the opening. It's great. And here at here at Tycon, of course, we're all about what to do, not what not to That's do. That's exactly right. So given that definition, yep. um, how do you practice impact investing, right? Like how, how do we do this in our own work and how do we develop an investment philosophy? So in other words, how do you know if you've achieved what you call mm. a double bottom That's line? That's great. So we do think of the first bottom line, the financial return, and the second bottom line as being this integrated, it's, to, it's really just two sides of the same coin as opposed to being different coins. And there's lots of frameworks for how you think about impact investing, but there's a number of attributes as we think about what the practice is. The first is this notion of additionality. It's the incremental positive change as a res that wouldn't have happened if you weren't otherwise doing this. That's a very important part. It's coupled with intentionality. This is not something that just happens on its own. It's not that you invest in companies and that they have impact. It's the intentionality around and the deliberate approach to the practice of impact investing and the specific programmatic ways that you're going to employ efforts to achieve that second bottom line. There's also this notion of measurement, which is critical to the practice of doing impact investing, at least in our firm. And again, if we're going to have an impact, then we need to develop the right kinds of metrics to measure and monitor the kinds of progress we're making across a series of dimensions that are appropriate for the companies that we're investing in. And finally, we talk a lot about scale. Uh, in order to have impact, it's not good enough to just have a great idea. The companies we're investing in won't have impact unless they emerge at scale to really solve and tackle these, these big challenges and problems uh, that we've been talking about here. So intentionality, mm -hmm. measuring results, yeah. and scale. And additionality. And additionality. Yeah. Those are the things that we, I need to add additionality. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, I think for all of us, we start hearing this, and we see it, and we read about it, 
and we specifically hear announcements, sure. right? We're hearing all of these amazing big announcements, big new $1 billion impact funds from TPG, from, from Bain, Gates, and sure. many others recently. Why is there such a focus, such a buzz about impact investing now? What's changing now? Yeah. Well, you know, at, at the venture side of the equation, uh, I think it's important to note that we are only as good as the entrepreneurs we back. This is not about us or any of the other firms that you mentioned. It's really about the entrepreneurs. And what we're seeing is this massive sea shift in the attitudes and capabilities of entrepreneurs who, again, historically the conventional wisdom of capitalism was, as I said, you make money by day, you may have a philanthropic effort uh, in your, in your non-work time, but they were divorced. And now what you're seeing is this incredible sea change. It's this wave of entrepreneurs who are purpose-driven, who are mission-oriented, who want that integrated approach. And it's not just some entrepreneurs, it's many of the best and brightest entrepreneurs. It's everything ranging from the great executives who've had accomplishments, who've had success, who want to make the next chapter in their personal and professional lives uh, all around impact, all the way down to the millennials. You know, when we talk about uh, some of the, the executives of the, of, of the older generations, it's a change in what they grew up with. But the millennials, this is just part of the ethos. You know, we're seeing so many young entrepreneurs where they're not changing the way they're look, looking at the world for impact, but impact is that generation. And so we're just seeing an incredible number of entrepreneurs, the quality of entrepreneurs. We're also seeing, and it, it's an area that I know you spend a lot of time in, the generational wealth transfer. Mm -hmm. As the next generation begins to really control and think about how they want to invest, uh, impact, because of it being part of the ethos, becomes one of the emerging areas uh, that's becoming increasingly important. So, we think it's great that there's investment interest here, and there clearly is. You mentioned a number of them, largely in, a lot of them in the later stage, which is very important to us as earlier stage venture investors, is to have the kind of capital in the later parts of the capital markets food chain to fund some of these great ideas and innovation. We're seeing it actually at the limited partner side. We're seeing so many uh, limited partners now do allocation around impact. We're seeing corporates yes. develop a new kind of social responsibility uh, set of initiatives. So all around the capital food chain, we're seeing this emergence, but it really does come down to the great entrepreneurs. Yeah, well, what's so terrific about the social impact track here is the conversation after ours will continue through those individual entrepreneurs who are, who are making these incredible yeah. differences, and then the companies, and then certainly these new models that mm -hmm. are coming up. Yeah. But how does DBL do it, right? So we have Iris sitting here, and he's running a, what, a, a $400 million fund right now. So this is, you know, we're not talking tiny anymore. We're talking mm. something big here. How does DBL differentiate itself from the other firms in the traditional venture investment yeah. space? Well, first of all, I have to say, um, I'm not doing it. Our team's doing it. I'm fortunate to work on, with a great team of partners uh, and a set of colleagues that are just as passionate and committed as I am. I happen to work with one of the great impact investing pioneers, Nancy Fund. And so I'm fortunate that most of that what we do is, is definitely not about I, it's about uh, the we of our team that I'm very appreciative of. Uh, the firm over uh, a period of years has really developed this notion, uh, back to the intentionality, that this is about developing a common set of objectives with our entrepreneurs. And from the time we invest, where we actually have as part of our term sheet, this notion of how we're going to achieve impact with these companies, and we sit down from the day we invest and talk about what are the ways that we can impact the business uh, and actually have initiatives that we think can help first bottom line while achieving and realizing the second bottom line mission. And we serve as a bridge. We have programmatic efforts. We actually have someone on our team that spends morning, noon, and night. The only job is to help realize some of these second bottom line initiatives, all of the partners and full team, in addition to all of the classic venture uh, work that we do as board members and as partners with our companies, have second bottom line orientation around it. And so it's really all about the hands-on side of not just being a financial venture capitalist, but developing programmatic ways uh, to make introductions and achieve second bottom line mission. I like to say that in some ways it's hard in a startup. You're trying to deal with the food, air, and water uh, side of Maslow's hierarchy. 
But everyone has ideas and aspirations to do more. And so what we become is a partner to help realize and build bridges to some of those objectives that you might not otherwise be able to do when you're a young startup. Well, um, because we've already realized that neither one of us are young anymore. <laughs> um, you've been in VC for over 20 years. How has being an impact investor changed the lens of how you look at potential investments as a, mm. as a, as a VC impact investor? Are there different critical issues that you look at, differences? You know, what, what I think's changed the most is that this was often perceived as an area that if you were doing it, it was an albatross. Yes. And now it's a strategic differentiator. And that's in a massive difference from where we sit today. And because of that, some of the great entrepreneurs, uh, we feel very privileged to be partners with them because they want partners that have that alignment in purpose, where in developing the kind of companies they want to develop, it's not that they're going against the tide of a financial investor who doesn't view the importance of it, but rather partnering with those entrepreneurs to realize that. And so you know, over the period of years, that really becomes part of an evaluation process for us. Many of the great companies we're involved with, again, aren't successful in spite of their mission, but often because of them. Mm -hmm. And these entrepreneurs, because they're mission-driven, one of the, the, the lessons over uh, more than two decades of doing this is that startups are hard, and inevitably they're gonna have challenges. There's no great company that hasn't had that bump in the road, that hasn't had that period of time of challenge. The mercenaries often take uh, an off-ramp when the going gets tough. The missionaries buckle down and find their way through it. And we have so many examples in our historic portfolio of where the competitors, who often were in the same sector and doing it for different reasons, took that off-ramp. And our teams really hunkered down. I give the, so much credit to the tenacity and perseverance aligned with the mission that they have to get through those tough times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it is tough sticking with this work, especially sure. when you realize that it's not just a return that you're looking for, right. right? That you are changing, you're changing lives, you're changing our environment. And we're all sitting here realizing that as investors and as social entrepreneurs, that we want to know the areas that are hot right now, right? Like, mm. we want to know what is exciting right now. So, what areas are you targeting for current investment? Well, I'm going to start with energy because we're undergoing a massive transformation in the energy industry. We're going to see just, we've already begun to see the early inklings of the change in the 21st century energy economy. And it really starts with cost down. You know, you've seen solar uh, cost reduction of more than 80 plus percent over the last five or six years. It's catalyzed a set of adoption in that industry that's unprecedented. Um, it's true on the LED side. You know, LEDs went from $100 a lumen to a penny a lumen over about 15 or 16 years. And as evidenced by GE, which we always associated with the compact fluorescent, deciding to literally do a 180 and totally focus on the LED industry. And so many other examples that we're now seeing massive cost reduction. Mm -hmm. And there's probably been more energy innovation we've seen over the last decade than the prior century combined. And there still continues to be so many areas that we see each and every day of entrepreneurs that are walking in uh, the door around these areas, uh, the transportation industry, and more. So it's a super exciting area. Uh, we have a number of companies. I loved uh, one of the problems on the slide to introduce this, the problem slide of the almost billion and a half people that lack access to electricity. And what we're beginning to see is some of these innovations really start to get deployed in the developing world. We have a company, Off Grid Electric, that's doing this. And it's really powerful when you can actually br begin to bring electricity and energy. And then layer on, once you have energy and electricity, so many other things uh, get catalyzed. Better health, the development of, of additional initiatives that we're seeing. And so that's become an exciting area for us. Um, the issue, uh, the areas of food and agriculture. I, again, one of the other bullet points I saw was around hunger. And we too see each and every one of those bullet points not only as problems, but opportunities for innovation. So in the area of food and ag, much like energy, it's been a desert of innovation over the last century. And we're beginning to see the kinds of entrepreneurship in these areas that we haven't seen before. 
A few of our recent deals have been in the areas of food and ag. We have a company we just invested in called Appeal Sciences that is dealing with the issue of food waste. A third to a half of our food ends up being in landfill. And if we're going to go from 7 to 10 billion people over the coming decades, we're going to have to find a different way to feed our world. What Appeal is doing is finding a way to extend the life of produce by anywhere between two to 500 percent and do so in a fully natural way and without food, the, the cold food chain and cold storage that really defines the developed world. As a result of that, it has massive application for the developing world. When you can extend the life of produce and not need refrigeration, Think about the areas of the world that today we can't ship to because it just takes too many days and there's spoilage before then. And it's a great entrepreneur that was in other industries applying his biology and frankly energy experience to this problem. We have another company, Farmers Business Network. FBN is tackling the issue of small farmers. The lion's share of farmers are, are small farmers. They're not on the big farms. And yet there's oligopolies they're dealing with on both the supply and demand side. We finally have the ability to bring tools and technology to enable small farmers to run the business much like some of the large farms have done historically. And so it's very powerful, particularly in where a small farm has been at the at razor's edge of profitability in some cycles. This provides the tools to enable that. Um, we have another initiative around window into planet Earth. And that's around our space and geo and mapping technologies. We're early investors in SpaceX, uh, which is a great example of thinking about an oligopoly industry in, in new ways. Uh, the space industry has been defined by we send a rocket up, and it's a single use, and that's it. Well, for any of you who flew here today, as you did, imagine when you got off the plane, if we flew away, threw away the plane. Well, the, with the, the cost plane, of the, the ticket plane that I was on, we could really throw that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the cost of your ticket would have cost a lot more if it was single use. The ability to amortize travel as we do when we fly is now being applied to the issue of aerospace. And when you do that, it unlocks a whole set of new applications that we just haven't seen before. One of those applications ends up being how we image planet Earth. We're in a company called used to be called Planet Labs, now called Planet that is putting up a constellation of satellites, satellites that used to cost hundreds of millions of dollars and be the size of a school bus, now be uh, shrunk down because of the innovation around electronics to the size of a lunchbox and cost only hundreds of thousands of dollars. By putting up a full constellation, we can get a window into planet Earth that we've never had before. And so when we do that, again, radical new ways of, of innovating that we just haven't seen. I'd finally say, and it's probably the most important thing, we have a number of other sectors that we do invest in, but one of the important disciplines over the period of years we've done this is the discipline of being open-minded when a new entrepreneur uh, comes in with a new idea, a new industry that doesn't neatly fit within your frameworks. And having the open-mindedness not to be stuck in the rigidity of what you have thought about as your areas of investment, but being open-minded enough to see these are new ideas that if we had spent all of our time in the closed, in the four walls of our office, we would never have thought of. But some really creative entrepreneur is using new kinds of thinking and technology and being that bold, audacious, irrational entrepreneur that we, uh, that great quote at the beginning of this, and part of our job is to try and discipline ourselves to be open-minded to those. Well, I, I, I love that closing thought, especially as I'm thinking about the, the ag work that you're doing and ensuring that mm. produce can get to millions of people in developing countries. You know, my young child would think that peanut butter, which has a shelf life of forever, <laughs> is enough, but um, that work is so exciting. Like, other exciting things about you, you know, you were an early investor in Tesla, and you're still on the board. The company is changing in so many ways. Tell us a little bit about the evolution and lessons for other companies. You know, Tesla is really a good example of one that, although it trips off the tongue today as being successful with a, about a $50 billion market cap and, uh, and really innovating in ways that people appreciate, I actually think it's important to remember that when we did that investment, it not only was viewed as, viewed as contrarian, but people really thought we were crazy. It was at a time when people didn't think that you could have a car that was environmental and be a great car. It was, the, it was this notion of trade-off. 
And in the early days, you know, this was a, uh, an era when people thought if you wanted to drive an electric car, it looked like a golf cart and went 30 miles. <laughs> and to your point of, you know, to the point of, of really changing the or into the and, I think Tesla was a great example of that and defines our practice. It's similarly an example of that bold, audacious thinking, which Elon and the Tesla team, I think, are the embodiment of, but so many other entrepreneurs we work with really are exactly the same. They're not deciding where, what to pursue based on conventional wisdom. And they've got the kind of, of bold thinking to really take on incumbency and status quo. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about the, what, what Tesla has been an example of, I think it's really inspiring for so many of the entrepreneurs we work with in, in thinking about those parts of the Tesla success to date. Yeah, well, look, most people, and I know that there were so many who thought that this was never going right. to take off, right? right? And how many people in the room have an iPhone <laughs> in their hand right now? So exactly, everyone is, is, is raising their hand. It's all because you're all tweeting about this amazing <laughs> program, the social impact track at Tycon. <laughs> all right, I can't let you go mm. without addressing the big white elephant in the room. Does impact investing and all the stuff that you've been telling us about, mm. And all of the money being put in it today in areas like alternative energy still makes sense given President Trump's climate agenda? Mm. It's a great question. We get asked this question all the time. Let's first uh, all agree that it has not been federal energy policy that has driven any of this innovation. We actually have been devoid of federal energy policy here in the U.S. It has actually been led by the states, and there's been a number of innovative thinking at the state level, not the federal level. So that's number one. Second, what's also led this has been the radical cost decline. It's been the innovations that I was referencing before that's, that's driving this, that's catalyzing this. And irrespective of policy, it is economics that is leading to cost parity and superiority in many areas. The other good news is policy has been an amazing driver. It's just been at the state level and at many international levels. Great examples that when we think about how to do clean energy and what the opportunity is, it is not a federal issue. The other thing I'd probably close with is, in many ways, some of this uh, agenda is actually causing the committed to be more committed. And that's ironically been a catalyst for the movement, not something that can hold us back. And so for anyone out there who is as committed to clean energy or any of the other areas of impact, this is a renaissance time. This is a time when there's more of us doing this than ever before. And folks who are thinking about any federal or individual um, naysayer, I think only has to look to the naysayers of old, to the ones we've referenced, and a lot more. That's exactly right. So the so the alternative energy bus has left the station, right? It's not coming back. So <laughs> we better be along back. for the ride. Well said. We have time for just a couple of questions because we were running a little late to start. So I want to open it up, um, and if you raise your hand, I'll try and see you by the blinding light. Uh, there's many on this side of the room. I don't know who, who has the mic. But if we can grab a mic and, and maybe either in the front or in the back. Hello, hello. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Oh, uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. My question is. T tell us your name. Oh, my name is Dr. Kailas Gupta. Nice I'm to meet from you. the International Emergency Management Society. We are in the field of disaster management. Great. Uh, so my question is, if uh, for social impact, if uh, I'm a social entrepreneur, I want, to, uh, I got a project and not not for profit, only to save like human lives in disasters. So and uh, to sustain, we will have something, but not to make profit. Would you be interested? Oh, he's so, pi he's pitching you right now, Ira. This is a pitch. Right. This is a pitch. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you. <laughs> So I think the question was, you're not trying to do something for profit, but you do have a mission orientation to change the world. Is this something that I'd be interested in? And the answer is absolutely, just not within the context of DVL. What we do at DVL is invest in for-profit startup innovations that combine this integrated approach. But of course, there's lots of uh, parts of what we do that perhaps can be collaborate with our nonprofit side. We spend a, a lot of our time finding 
other parts of our ecosystem to collaborate with our startups. Terrific, thank you. Um, the next question. Yes, hi, my name is Richard Curtin. I'm with a for-profit social impact company. Right. Um, you did bring up Maslow's hierarchy, which is one of my favorite uh, uh, pyramids. We're all trying to self-actualize. Okay, so, <laughs> so I'm at the self-actualization stage, but the opening slide there didn't uh, or address the billion plus people with, with very poor literacy. Mm. And so where does uh, ed tech, social impact, for profit, like my organization, uh, I'll come pitch you later. All right. Uh, but where does it stand in the rankings? Because you talked about energy, you talked Absolutely. about food. The next level on Hugely the hierarchy important. is education. Absolutely right. And actually, so I appreciate you bringing that up. And it's an incredible area of innovation today. And I think it's actually, there's not, it's, we don't view it as siloed to many of the things we have talked about. In fact, one of, the, one of the primary benefits, in addition to health and crime, when you bring energy to the billion and a half that we're referenced without, is education. The ability to have enough energy to do studies is critically important. And so EdTech is a, is a super exciting area. There's lots of innovation on it. And excited to hear more about what you have to and, do. And I think in a later panel, we're going to have Mouse ABC here as well. Yep. So we're definitely going to be talking about EdTech and literacy. I love you bringing it up. We have time for, I know you all have burning questions. I know. I know. <laughs> Next year, we're going to have to make social impact the, an, an entire day of TyCon. I know. All right. I know. Um, so one last question in the front. A, the, a new mic. A new mic. Thank you. Yeah. You were like the, uh, the Charlie Brown uh, Peanuts care, an adult in one of those cartoons. We, right. we couldn't hear you. Uh, my, my name is Rao Madhukuri. I, I live in Poland uh, for the last 32 years. Uh, and then. I, my question to you is, we have a, like a content like online content like Khan Academy available, right? Uh, well done content. Using it's hard mobile, to hear. Yeah. I mean, Khan Academy is the online content available for, for yeah. Khan yeah. Academy. Yeah. So we can use, Khan. yeah, cell phone. We can use mobile networks to deliver that content to entire Africa or in US or in India or wherever, right? So we can use the already existing technology like uh, mobile networks to deliver that content to the, all the kids. So what do you think about that? So, so the question is that we could use the, um, the technology that Khan Academy is using to connect to the children already. Right, right. Absolutely. And, and give, give unlimited access to the children? And give them access to learn. Yes, yes well, we, we agree and appreciate what you're doing at Khan Academy. It's been an incredible initiative. Remember when Khan Academy started and what it's become today is, is inspiring to all of us. So thanks for all the great work you're doing. That's right. And, 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 and Sal Khan probably is still under 40. So um, with that, I want to thank Ira for this incredible non-fireside chat, non-fireside <laughs> chat. You've shown us that there's been more innovation in the past 10 years than there's been in the prior 100 years. So. I am so excited about the glimpse in innovation that you've given us. I can't look, I can't wait to see the journey ahead. Thank you, Thank you Ira. Thank you so much. <laughs>